All right, well, good evening. Let's open our Bibles again to the Gospel of John, if you would, where hopefully, prayerfully, we will make our way through the first chapter. And we are going to find ourselves beginning tonight in verse 35 of the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Now, by way of introduction, we've mentioned these uh, first several of our times together that the focus of the Gospel of John is uh, different than the other Gospels. It's focused primarily on the deity of Christ, the, the, the God-man, uh, looking at his, at his eternal nature. Now, the Gospel of Matthew, if you recall, uh, Matthew focuses on the Jewish Messiah there in his Gospel, whereas Mark focuses on Jesus being a suffering servant as it's written to a more Roman culture. The Gospel of Luke focuses more on a Greek uh, a contingent, a Greek uh, a society, and he focuses on the, the Jesus as the Son of Man, this perfect man, where John, again, looks at the deity of Jesus. This Gospel is very different from the other three, the, those that are called synoptic Gospels. You won't find any parables here. There's no genealogy in the Gospel of John. There's no manger scene. But instead, what John writes in uh, chapter 20, verse 31 specifically, is the purpose of him writing the Gospel. And it's twofold. First, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And then secondly, that believing, you may have life in his name. So he doesn't just leave us in the spot where, where we believe, but then in this belief, we get the opportunity to have life. Now, where we left off last time was with John the Baptist bearing witness to Jesus. John was Jesus' cousin, and he bears witness by saying, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And so this is where we'll pick up then in verse 35, after John has just made this proclamation. And we start with, again, the next day. So the day after, he makes the proclamation that Jesus is the Son of God. Again, the next day, in verse 35, John stood with two of his disciples. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And so, right off the bat, we see John standing there with two of his disciples. These disciples are unnamed at this point in time. Later on, we'll see in the... Uh, following verses that one of them is identified as Andrew. The other one is not clearly identified, but most Bible scholars believe the other of the disciples to John the Baptist is none other than our author, John the Revelator. And so what John the Baptist says once again the following day is he declares, behold the Lamb of God. And these two men that were with him, that were followers of John the Baptist, they just leave and they go to follow Jesus. I think it's important for us to note that John the Baptist doesn't throw any kind of fit. He doesn't say, hey, I thought you guys were with me. What are you doing, you know, just bailing on me like this? But instead, by declaring, behold, the Lamb of God, he's pointing things back to Jesus as the Christ. And really for us, this is an important thing to, to grasp as a side note, is that always we should be pointing, behold, the Lamb of God. It's not about rules and regulations and denominations, but it's about pointing everything to the king, right? And following Jesus. And so I think that's an important lesson we can pick up in these first few verses. John wasn't upset that these guys just left him standing there. But instead, then in verse 38, uh, the first portion of that we see, And then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, he said to them, What do you seek? Now, these are the first recorded words of Jesus in the Gospel of John. And what he asks is a question that really goes all the way down to us, even to this present day. What do you seek? It's a, it's a question we can ask ourselves sitting right here, right now. What is it that we seek? Right? For some of us, we're in pain, and we're seeking relief from that pain. For others, we're seeking relationship. This is a place we can get to know people. We can have, we can have community, right? There are others that are seeking the meaning of it all. And we're wondering these things. And so we come in here with all these, these questions. There are some that are seeking a husband. And for those of you that are married, that's probably a problem. You should think about that a little bit. But we come seeking different things, right? And what I love about this is Jesus knows it. <laughs> He's not surprised. 
He's not shocked. In fact, it's the very first thing he asks. What is it that you seek? He knows that we're all looking for something. Now then, the end of this 38th verse, and they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated teacher, where are you staying? So he asked them this great uh, big question that they could hopefully answer. And instead of answering it, they completely deflect the question. They don't answer it at all. And I, I find this kind of humorous, like maybe they got nervous, right? And the funny thing is, for, for all of Israel, for thousands of years, they've actually been looking for the Messiah. This is the prophesied one, the anointed one of Israel. And here he is in front of them. And he asks them, what is it that you seek? And the answer that they should give is, you, you're the one we seek. But that sounds a little creepy, doesn't it? Like, it seems a little bold to just come out and say it. And so instead, they ask a way less creepy question. Hey, where are you staying? I mean, maybe they've got a white uh, unmarked van with no windows, you know. But we'll give you a ride, Jesus. <laughs> just tell us where you're staying. Hop on in. Like, this seems like an even worse thing to ask. And I think what, when it really gets down to the point I'm trying to make by being a little humorous is that we get so nervous when it comes to just asking the thing that's really on our heart, right? Oftentimes, we've got something that's on our mind, and Jesus, in, in, in that still small voice, he says, well, what is it you seek? He just wants conversation with us, and yet we're, we're hesitant to tell him, look, this is what's on my heart. This is what I seek. Instead, we, we ask some other question. We beat around the bush with him. And, and the thing is, what we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, Paul writing to the church there in Corinth, is he says, For all the promises of God in him, it's important, in him are yes, and in him amen, to the glory of God through us. So the real question is, what are we nervous about? Right? All promises made in him are yes and amen. Yes, and so be it. And the, the key, though, is that it's in him, right? James says, says you have not because you ask not, or you ask and miss. Oftentimes, I ask and miss. It's when our will lines up with the will of God that the answer is always yes, and it's always amen. So then, continuing on with verse 39. And he said to them, come and see. And they came, and they saw where he was staying, and they remained with him for that day, for now it was about the tenth hour. So Jesus' response to them asking, where are you staying? He doesn't uh, send them a text with the address. He doesn't give them a Google pin drop and say, you know, here you go, find your way. Instead, he says, come and see. And then he takes them there. That's always his response, right? Come and see. Come on with me. And he's always inviting. This is something that's, that's important for us to understand as we're thinking about the, this nervousness when it comes to inviting people to church, right? That, that it can be just as simple as come and see. Come and see for yourself. Come and check things out for yourself. And on Wednesday nights, it's great because you can say, come, see, and eat, right? Thank you, ladies down there, for what you're doing. It's not just come and see. It's come, see, and get your belly full at the same time. Now, then at the end of this verse... John points out a specific detail, which we could pass over, but I think it's important. He says, and, and they remained with him that day, for now it was about the tenth hour. Now the tenth hour, we don't know exactly what time that would be. If, if John was writing there based on the Roman clock, theirs started at midnight, so it would be 10 a.m. Now if he was writing based on the Hebrew clock, theirs starts at 6 in the morning, so therefore it would be 4 in the afternoon. So there's this discrepancy. But the real important thing to point out is that for these two men, these two disciples that were there with Jesus, they were seeing him for the first time. They were learning about him for the first time. They were coming to know him, that John documented the exact hour. Think about the time where you really came to know Jesus for the first time. Maybe you can't document the exact hour, but, but I would gather that you can say exactly where you were. You know that moment, you know that experience, you know that place you were at where your hands were up and you were, you were just giving him glory because you knew you didn't deserve to be there and yet there you were with him. Come and see. And if you haven't experienced that, boy, that's a, that's a life changer. 
that's something that you, you won't soon forget. Now then, in verse 40, what we see is one of the, the two who heard John speak, that being John the Baptist, and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he was found, and he found his own brother, Simon, and he said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. So one of the two, as I mentioned in the opening, was Andrew. And Andrew's response to coming to meet Jesus, the first thing he did is he went out to find his brother, right? So as we come to this, this revelation, this life-changing experience, what do we want to do? We want to tell somebody that we love and we care about. So for Andrew, that person was his brother, Simon Peter. And he goes to him, and he, and he brings him to Jesus. And this is something we see consistently in the life of Andrew. We don't get a lot of information about him in the gospel. But what we do get is he is continually bringing people to Jesus. Right? He, he isn't giving any great evangelical messages like his big brother. He's not giving any empowered speeches that we see, at least not, not in our, our recorded text. But he is always bringing people to Jesus. Now, this reminds me of the story of Edward Kimball. Probably not a name as familiar to most of you, probably not any of you, in fact. But Edward Kimball in the 1850s was a dry goods salesman in the Boston area. And he also uh, taught a, a, a small Sunday school class for young men. And in this small Sunday school class, there was one particular young man, man that, that kind of gripped his heart. It didn't seem like... Like his words are really getting through. In fact, he, he was a little brash. Uh, Kimball was fairly certain he was even illiterate. Uh, he was a little bit rude. But God put this young man on his heart. And so, uh, feeling convicted, he wanted to go down and, and, and speak to the young man at his place of work. And so he goes down to the shoe store that this young man works at. And as he's heading down that way to talk to him about Jesus and, and the love that Christ has for him, he gets nervous and he walks right past the door of the shop. And he, feeling you know, bad about walking back, he turns around, he goes back to the door of the, of the shoe store and he walks in and the young man is there in the back room and he's, and he's stocking shoes and he proceeds to share the love that Jesus has for this young man with him. And as he's sharing, the, the young man actually accepts Jesus as his Lord and Savior. He, he's just bringing the young man to Christ, right? Now, it doesn't say that he was any great speaker. There wasn't anything particularly special about Edward Kimball other than he cared for this young man. Now, this young man that he shared Jesus with might be a little more familiar. His name was Dwight Lyman Moody. So that day, D.L. Moody, the, the man who founded Moody Bible Institute, Moody's Handbook of Theology, this same man was led to Jesus by Edward Kimball. You see, for every Edward Kimball, there's a D.L. Moody. And for every Peter, there's an Andrew. Just simply bringing someone to Christ. Here you are, Lord. You work it out with them. I'm just doing what you called me to do. Now, continuing on in the end of verse 42. And he brought him to Jesus, this being Andrew. And now... Jesus looked at him, being Peter, and he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah, and you shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. And so the first thing that Jesus does upon meeting Peter is gives him a nickname. I love this. right? Jesus apparently was into nicknames, and he liked cool, manly nicknames. For John the Revelator, he called him and his brother James the sons of thunder. And for Peter, he calls him Cephas, which is translated the stone or the rock. I like this. And what I think is important for us is that Jesus sees in Peter what even he doesn't know is there. You see, Peter was, according to Bible history, a big, burly guy, a tough guy, manly man, a fisherman. But when the chips are really down, Peter's the guy that denies even knowing Jesus three different times. And yet... On the day of Pentecost, who's the man that's up there giving the, the, the evangelical message where 3,000 people are saved? It's none other than Peter, right? The rock. So as Jesus looks at him, he sees something completely different. And he does the same thing for you and I. He doesn't see what we are. He sees what we're going to be. Now then, the next person we see 
in verse 43, continuing on, in the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. And he found Philip, and he said to him, Follow me. And now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael, and he said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And so I find this also to be a little bit funny is because Philip says, Hey, we found the Messiah. And yet, as you read, it's pretty clear Jesus uh, actually found him. Do you realize that? Jesus always finds us first. In fact, Paul makes that clear in Romans 3.11 that no one seeks after God. So Jesus finds Philip, but hey, you know, it's a minor detail. Hey, we found the Messiah. But the, 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 an attribute we see throughout Philip's life is that he is always willing to go, always willing to be a servant, always willing to be obedient and never with a complaint. He's called to serve in Acts chapter 6. He and six other men are called to serve widows there in Jerusalem. He's also called to evangelize in Acts chapter 8. In, in that particular spot, Philip is called to not only evangelize, but specifically called to evangelize to an Ethiopian eunuch riding in a chariot. Anybody ever got that specific of a calling before? I'm guessing not. Uh, but here... What I think is interesting about this is he's called in verse 28 of Acts chapter 8, and then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. Now, overtaking a chariot would be like the Lord telling you to go run out and stop traffic and hop in that car and then evangelize, right? So I don't know that anybody's getting that kind of a dynamic calling. Maybe you are, and, and by all means, take a, take a page out of Philip's book. Be obedient. But the, the real point in this is that Philip was continually obedient to the call God gave him. He's a true servant, never putting up a fight about what he's called to do. Now then, continuing on, we see the next one called by the Lord. And verse 46, And Nathanael said to him, this after Philip uh, goes to Nathanael and says, We have found that whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael's response, as he says to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. Now, Nathanael's uh, answer is, is uh, uh, rather enjoyable. As he says, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? We probably all said this about uh, can anything good come out of insert small town that's not my own, right? We've got a lot of people in here from small towns. For me, personally, I'm from the small town of Casey, Illinois, home of 2,900 people. My graduating class had 83, home of the Warriors, go purple and gold, right? We didn't have a whole lot going on, but we had that. And one other thing we had is that we weren't from Martinsville, which was six miles away, and they only had 1,000 people, home of the Blue Streaks, who we affectionately called the Brown Streaks, right? <laughs> Thank the Lord we weren't from Martinsville, right? And that's what Nathaniel's essentially saying. Besides, what, what a, a, maybe Nathaniel was a scholar, and he even knew that in uh, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, the Messiah is supposed to come from Bethlehem, not Nazareth. Come on, Philip, what are you talking about? But instead, Philip steals a line from Jesus as he says, come and see. Just come and see what's going on. And, and what I really take out of this is he's essentially telling Nathaniel, what do you have to lose? And that's something as we're inviting people to church, that's something we can take from this. What is it that you have to lose? Right? Come and see what's going on. Come and see what's taking place. Because, you know, the, the usual, the typical pushback you'll get is church is just full of a bunch of hypocrites. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It is chock full of them. Church is full of, of liars and thieves and drunks and drug addicts, right? Adulterers. Sounds like Congress. But, but, but here's the thing. Church is also full of changed lives. So when we invite people to come and see, this is really what we're inviting them to come and check out. Yep, you know what? You're absolutely right. All those things were who, who those people were. And instead, what we have in here is a collection of people that are, that are changed. And that's really the proof we're inviting people to come in and see, right? Yeah, there's a lot of folks that are tore up from the floor. But you know what? There's also a whole lot of changed 
lives sitting all around. Come and see is the call that Philip gives to Nathanael. And then in verse 47, And Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, and he said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Now the first thing to point out here is Jesus sees him coming. And so as we think about it, Jesus always sees us coming. He's never taken by surprise. It's never a shock to him that here you come. Just like with the, the father of the prodigal son, right? Here's the prodigal. He, he's finally blown all of his inheritance. He's blown everything that his dad ever gave him. He's down to the point to where he's, he's eating out of the pig trough. And finally he comes to his senses and thinks, man, even my father's servants have it better than me. I'm just going to go back to him and ask to be a servant. And as he walks back towards his father's house, his dad, there on the porch, looking. His dad doesn't just sit there and wait. He gets up off the porch and he starts running. He's always looking. He's always the one that sees first. Even before the son sees the dad, the dad sees him. And he takes off. And what Jesus says to Nathanael is, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. So what he's really saying is, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no Jacob. Now, Jacob's an interesting character if we look back at the Old Testament. What we see is a, is a young man that was born one of a twin, right? His older brother, Esau. Apparently in this time, they weren't really clever when it came to naming kids. Esau is the firstborn to Isaac. And as he comes out, they look at him, and apparently he was a furry little guy. And so they call him Esau, which means hairy, right? But then as, as Esau is being delivered, there right on the heel of his big brother is Jacob, actually holding on to his heel. And so again, they're so very clever. They name him heel catcher, Jacob. And so if this was the case today, I would have uh, poopy, pukey, screamy, snotty. These would be all my kids. <laughs> Thankfully, we didn't do that. But this is, this is how Jacob comes into the world, a heel catcher. And then as he grows, he deceives his older brother Esau out of his spiritual blessing. He's able to trick it out of him. And then he deceives his older brother Esau even out of his physical blessing. He actually disguises himself as his older brother and gets the blessing from their father Isaac. He's a deceiver, a heel catcher. Now then, he runs away for his life to, to his father. Uh, uh, uncle Laban's house. And as he's there with his uncle Laban, he, he meets his wife, right? And, and he falls in love. But Laban actually tricks him and gives him the older daughter, Leah, instead of Rachel. So Jacob's there. He has to work for 14 years for these two wives, not just one. And then he decides because his father-in-law is such a trickster, he's going to trick him back. And he does just that with the, with the flocks. So he tricks his father-in-law. And then he ends up running off in the middle of the night, away, back to the land of Canaan. And the point in all this is that Jacob was a deceiver until right before he's getting ready to go back and meet his brother for the first time. He's so terrified, this older brother that wants to kill him. He lays his head down, and in a vision, he actually wrestles with God all night long. And crying out there as he holds on to God, he actually, the, the Lord actually injures his hip, but he won't let go of the Lord. He won't let go, and he says, bless me. I won't let you go until you bless me. And what he tells him there is that no longer will you be Jacob. No longer heel catcher, deceiver. But now your name is Israel, governed by the law. You see, this is a run-in that we get with when we meet the Lord, right? No longer are you what you once were. You're now a new creation. He comes out of this Israel. And so we see Jesus speaking to Nathaniel to tie this all together. He says, and here's an Israelite in whom there is no Jacob. So for all of Nathaniel's unbelief, one thing he is not, he is not deceitful, right? There is no Jacob. Now then in verse 48, and Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. So here's Nathanael. He's under the fig tree. Now the fig tree, it was used in that day for shade, 
for leisure, possibly even for study. So it's possible that Nathaniel was even there looking through his Torah, reading the, reading the Word of God. But the fig tree is also, again, biblically, this is a type, this is a picture of Israel. And what I noticed about this is just as quickly as Nathaniel is to be sarcastic, he's even that much quicker to believe in Jesus. What do I mean by that? Let's continue in verse 49. Is Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. This is his declaration just from Jesus pointing out that I saw you even there sitting under the fig tree. And Jesus in verse 50 answered and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe you will see greater things than these? And he said to him, most assuredly, I say to you hereafter, you shall see the heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the son of man. So the first thing to point out here is that Jesus is a big fan of Bachman Turner Overdrive. Because what he tells Nathaniel is, but baby, you just ain't seen nothing yet. No BTO fans here. That was from the message version. Sorry. Anyway, so this is, this is what uh, Jesus claims to Nathaniel. If you think this is big, you ain't seen nothing yet. Hang on. But what I wanted to point out is it's, it's interesting what things it takes to actually convince us that God is who he says he is, isn't it? Oftentimes, it's a way smaller thing than it is a way bigger thing. It's usually something little, something uh, that only we would notice, only that we would pick up on. It's a still small voice so very often. And this is the case with Nathaniel. And then lastly, to point out what Jesus is communicating here to Nathaniel for these young men, these young Israelites, this would be really mind-blowing. Because he essentially is taking their scriptures and he's completely tying it together with who he is. He's, he's saying to him that you will, uh, assuredly I say to you, you'll see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And what this calls us back to is the story of Jacob, who we just talked about for several minutes. And in Genesis 28... As Jacob is there, he's, he's running away from his brother Esau, who's threatened to kill him. He's headed towards his future father-in-law Laban's house. And what we see there in, in uh, chapter 28 of Genesis is as he lays his, his head down, what he sees specifically is a ladder reaching up to heaven. And then the angels of God are ascending and descending up and down off of the ladder. And so what... Jesus is basically doing is he's pulling all the text back together. These scriptures that are written nearly 2,000 years ago for a young Israelite boy, this would have been mind blown, right? And for us, what we can see is, is our Bible is tied together from one end to the other by the thread of the Holy Spirit. That this ladder that Jacob sees in his dream thousands of years before this moment, what Jesus is telling Nathaniel at this moment is, listen, this ladder is me. I'm the connection point. I'm the point that ties the earth to the heavens. And that no man comes to the Father except through me. There's only one way up a ladder, right? And that's Jesus Christ. That's what he's pointing out. This is the connection point between heaven and earth. The same as it is for us. This is the way, the truth, and the life. And so for Nathaniel, this is what's made so perfectly clear. And the same thing should be made clear for us here tonight. That there's no other way to get there. And the real question is, what is it that we seek? What is it that we're after? If it's the way, hey, you're in a good spot. Here's the ladder. Here's the escalator. Taking you right up to the man himself. And so, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for making a way for making a way for us to be connected, for giving us an opportunity to find you, to seek you. We know that we can't even do these things, that you're the one that actually finds us first. And so we thank you so much, Lord, for, for being that thing that ties all this together, that, that provides us access to which we, we can't have access to on our own. 
So we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for being the ladder that gives us an opportunity that affords us the ability to go to heaven. And we praise you in Jesus' name.